Good evening, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Bermuda National Trust, I would like to welcome you to the latest in our series of Trust Talks. My name is Anna Ridgway. I'm the Museum's Manager for the Trust. And the talk this evening is being given by Diana Chudley. Diana became a volunteer for the Bermuda National Trust 32 years ago when a team of people were recruited in 1988 by Margie Lloyd and the late Rosemary Clipper to survey all the buildings shown on the 1901 Ordnance Survey map of Bermuda. This map, usually called the Savage Map, was surveyed in 1898 and 1899 by Lieutenant Savage. It showed every building which then existed in Bermuda. The trust team took four years to visit and record the 4,000 buildings on this map. From this, the group then went on to research and produce architectural heritage books for each parish, including the town and city of Hamilton. So far, nine books have been published. Southampton is the one remaining parish to be written. Three historical house books of trust properties have also been published by the team, the latest being Waterville. And with that, I shall pass you over to Diana. <coughs> Anyway, good evening everybody and welcome to this Trust Talk on Waterville, the headquarters of the Bermuda National Trust. It's good to see at least some of you at the top of my screen. I hope you will enjoy this talk in the comfort of your own home. I expect you have all, actually I'm sure you have all been to Waterville, but just in case you haven't, it is at the foot of the lane in Paget Parish and is reached off Amanda Road opposite the entrance to Aberfeldy. The foot of the lane was the end of the shipping lane or channel into Hamilton Harbour. Once a busy port for Bermuda sloops, this area has since silted up though punts and powerboats remain as evidence of our island's maritime heritage. Sorry, we've got to get to the next one. Oh, that's right. Anyway. The Bermuda National Trust is 50 years old this year. Its story began at Waterville and continues there. This is how it all began 50 years ago on August the 13th, 1970. Sir John Cox Wright, the first trust president, is welcomed to the house by Elsie Gosling, far right. She was a long-term upstairs tenant. The first council members were also introduced to Waterville. Can you recognize any of these people? Starting from the left, council members are Henry Lang, Norman Gapes, Kit Aswood, Babs Gors Gosling, Louis Mowbray Sr., Anne Cartwright, Hinson Cooper, and Doc Trimingham. Council members absent from the lineup were Ed Kelly, Bob Steele and David Wingate. This evening I'm going to concentrate on Waterville's physical structure. I will save the story of the people who lived and worked in the house for another time. Waterville is a grade one listed building and plays an important part in Bermuda's architectural story. Oh, thanks. Sorry, we're having problems with the um, next slide, but we'll get there. I've been gathering information on Waterville over the last couple of years, whilst I have been working on this little book, Waterville, the Story of a House. It has been printed in China and is expected on the island soon. I got lots of help from other trust volunteers when writing this book. Very sadly, two of these, architectural historian Ed Chapel and researcher Faye Elliott, died in July this year. 
they will be missed. Waterville is the most recent publication in the Trust Historical House Guidebook series. Birdmont was published in 2011, Tucker House in 2015, and now Waterville in 2020. Now to get on with the story of Waterville. The house was designed for the Trimmingham family who lived upstairs over cellars. Their living quarters faced the main road. Underneath the cellars opened to the harbor. Cargo was stored in these cellars and enslaved per persons worked here. The kitchen for the early families was down below right. There's a big blue arrow for you to see it. The house was built with blocks of hand quarried Bermuda limestone. The lower walls were built in a wider stone than the upper. This created the setback of the upper story that you could see in this photo. The large chimney left on the east end of the house served the cooking fireplace in the kitchen in the cellar. The old kitchen right has been turned into an office for the trust conservation officer and volunteers. The fireplace is not easy to spot in its office setting, except for the large white painted beam, which also has an arrow. The fireplace opening has been blocked up and the alcove now holds books and papers used by old house volunteers. Questions I hope to answer this evening are, when was the house built? Who built it? What subsequent changes and additions have we made and when? I relied on the expertise of Ed Chapel. I also studied the writings of Andrew Trimmingham and the research of Faye Elliott and whatever other information I could find. I have come to some slightly different conclusions from previously published dating of Waterfall. <clears throat> we came to the conclusion that the house was most likely built by Judge John Trimmingham. It was built on the waterfront end of the three shares of land that he inherited from his father, President John. This land stretched from foot of the lane over Trimmingham Hill to Inglewood Lane and the South Shore. His father built Tankfield, an important early 18th century cruciform house in Paget Parish, which he left to his oldest son, Paul. John, the second son, got land. Judge John looks somewhat the worst for wear in his photo. Perhaps this is because it is a scan of a black and white photo taken in 1922. A Joseph Blackburn of a Black Joseph Blackburn painting. The original painting was destroyed in a house fire in 1930. Many thanks to John Adams for this scan and others, and for this his help with the Trimingham story. Next question: When was it built? Perhaps it was built around the time of George, Judge John's marriage. He married Elizabeth Jones on July the 11th, 1747. Perhaps the house was built about this time. In our research, we have found that a marriage was sometimes an event that triggered the building or renovation of a house. Therefore, we came to the conclusion that Waterville is a mid 18th century house most likely built by Judge John Tremiel. This is a plan of the probable mid 18th century house. It was drawn by Steve Conway, a former director of the trust, with input from Ed Chapel. The L-shaped floor plan is somewhat similar to the early plan of the trust owned Tucker House in St. George's which is also a mid 18th century house with living quarters over cellars. 
the old room names were taken from the 1789 inventory of Captain John Trimingham, a son of George John. The chimney on the right end of the house served the cooking fireplace in the kitchen below. There was no apparent form of heating in the rest of the house. You entered the house through the entry, the same as today. The main reception room, the hall, was on the left, and behind it was the hall chamber, the principal bedroom. To the right of the entry are two bedchambers. John and Elizabeth had six children. Now a quick look at the ownership of Waterville. It was built by a Tremium and owned by his descendants in it, until its sale in 1962 to the Bermuda Historical Monuments Trust, forerunner of the Bermuda National Trust. Louisa Trimingham, the eldest daughter of James Harvey Trimingham, the founder of Trimingham's, was the last sole owner of the house. Following her death in 1956, the property was briefly owned by a number of descendants of James Harvey Trimingham before it was sold to the Bermuda Historical Monuments Trust. The little girl with her is Barry Trimingham. Thanks to Rohan Shastri, a former museum's manager, for his skill in cleaning up this photo and for taking photos for the Waterville book. Waterville has expanded since it was first built. Here I've drawn the current outline of the house onto Steve's plan of the mid 18th century house. Hope you can see your way around now that I've added the modern room names. Still to be added are the front porch, the back rooms, and the chimney on the west end. This story continues with the growth of Waterville. Time did not stand still at Waterville over the next 270 or so years. Most of its subsequent owners made changes to the house to fit their needs. Judge John's son, Captain John, did not appear to make changes, judging from evidence in his inventory. The builder's grandson, James Harvey Trimingham, an auctioneer, made substantial changes in the early 19th century. His great-grandson, James Harvey Trimingham, the founder of Trimingham's, made alterations in the late 19th century. A great-great-grandson, Fred Trimingham, made changes in 1923 when Waterville became a guest house. The Bermuda Historical Monuments Trust, which purchased the house in 1962, converted it into income earning apartments. The Bermuda National Trust acquired the house in 1970 and has carefully converted it internally into office space. Uh, I will go through these changes in detail. Now a test for you, your turn. As we look at the front of Waterville, can you disturb it, determine what is mid 18th century and what is later? I think that's enough. Actually, quite a lot is early. Basically, the whole front facade dates from the mid 18th century. Blue arrows point to later additions. These are the front porch, the chimney at the left end, and the small porch on the left, and the small extension with windows on the right. I'll explain these as we continue with the story of Waterville. Now for the back of the house. Can you make out what is mid 18th century and what come, came later? There have been more changes at the back of the house. I have arrowed, arrowed the later additions. Starting at roof level, the additions are 
the rear wing at the top left, the central wing, and the chimney on the right end. At ground level, later additions are the water tank and the small porch and entrance to the schoolroom. Now to look at the changes in detail. The first round of changes was made in the early 19th century by James Harvey Trimmingham, a grandson of the builder. He was an auctioneer. You will discover as we proceed through this story that a lot of generations of Trimmingham shared the same first name. So I've tried to distinguish them by their occupations. Here I have labeled in red the early 19th century additions onto Steve's plan of the mid 18th century house. Auctioneer James Harvey substantially enlarged and updated his grandfather's house following his marriage to Charlotte Lightman in 1805. These changes were made in a neoclassical style. This style was popular in Bermuda in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Neoclassical is a revival of classical architecture. James Harvey's changes were substantial. They included new windows and doors, the addition of the front porch and the right rear wing. A veranda was built to provide a service pack passage at the back of the house. A window still exists in the reception area, which may have looked out onto this veranda. Ed Chapel believed that a small room above the old small water tank was constructed to take advantage of the water's coolness to store perishable food. He described it as a buttery, though it does not have the traditional Bermuda buttery roof line. James Harvey's tax assessment increased between 1810 and 1819, proving that substantial changes were made to the house at that time. James and Charlotte had nine children to fill this larger house. We are fortunate to have a can scan of this drawing of Waterville. It is believed to have been drawn by Princess Louise, the sixth child of Queen Victoria, during her visit to Bermuda in 1883. She stayed at Inglewood, a house on Trimmingham Hill across the road from Waterville. She was a trained artist and sculptor and attended what is now the Royal College of Art in London. Here I have arrowed the early 19th century editions made by the grandson. These are the front entry porch and the right rear wing. This wing is now the office of the trust financial director and the accounts department. This photo of the drawing room shows some of the changes made by grandson James Harvey. Windows and doors were changed and a decorative cornice was added here as well as in the adjacent director's office. Curiously, the fireplace did not exist at this time, and its surround is a 20th century addition. The pair of semicircular mahogany folding card tables under the far windows were commissioned by James Harvey for this room. They have survived at Waterville as they were given by his granddaughter, Louisa, to her brother Fred for use in the guest house. This is a close up of the cornice in the drawing room and in the trust director's office. Note it's very simple punch swag design. Now we come to the second round of changes. These were made in the late 19th century by yet another descendant called James Harvey Trimmingham. He was the founder of Trimmingham's department store and a great grandson of the builder. This 1896 watercolor by Bessie Gray 
hangs in the entry hall at Waterville and proved useful. Sorry, a test again. What has been added to the house since the early 19th century? The back central wing had been added by 1896, but I cannot see a chimney on the right end. Perhaps it was added soon after, when newly wedged Tommy and Lily Trimmingham lived at Waterville. There are no decorative masonry balls on the peaks of the roof. These were added later. Can you spot the privy on the waterfront? It's arrowed. This functioned with a drop into the sea and was flushed by the tides. Back to this 1883 drawing again, where you can see that the central wing had yet to be added to Waterville. Here I have labeled the late 19th century additions in green. The central wing was added to provide more space. James Harvey and his wife, Helen, had 10 children. The roof timbers in this central area are pine. Bermuda cedar is used in the rest of the roof. I've labeled the chimney that served the fireplace in the drawing room. It was originally a coal burning fireplace made of black metal. Coal, which had arrived on the island to service steamships, became fashionable for fireplaces in the late 19th century. The fireplace surround was later changed to the one we see in the drawing room today. More on that later. This photo clearly shows the three rear wings. I've numbered them in time sequence. The one on the right, number one, is part of the original mid 18th century house now the director's office. The one on the left, number two, was added in the early 19th century by a grandson of the builder. And the one in the middle, in the late 19th century, by a great grandson. This lovely photo of two elegant ladies paddling past Waterville must have been taken before 1923 when the water tank was built for the guest house. Perhaps that is an overflow tank by the early water tank. There's a small porch at cellar level, which is no longer there. Presumably this led from the house to the privy, which is exposed by the low tide. The privy looks larger in this photo than it did in the early Bessie Gray painting appears to be built at right angles to the house and there were obviously more space for seats. The seawall has since been extended outwards. Electricity had arrived in Bermuda. There are utility poles and wires along the lane to the left of the house. There are banana plants and cedar trees in the garden. The tamarind tree can be seen towering over the roof and black mangroves with their roots in the water on the near right. The next period of change at Waterville happened in the early 20th century when the house was reorganized and updated to function as a guest house. The guest house was run by Fred Trimmingham and his American wife, Ada. He was a great, great grandson of the builder and the eighth child of the founder of Trimmingham's. He returned to Bermuda in 1922 from New York, where he had worked as an accountant. His three elder sisters, Louisa, Charlotte, and Helen, who had been left a lifetime interest in their father's properties allowed Fred and Ada to live rent-free at Waterville and turn it into a guest house. Ada continued to run it for 30 years after her husband's death.
Waterville could take up to 13 guests. There was no advertisements for it could be found in the Royal Gazette or yearbooks. Its guest list must have been pretty exclusive. Bedrooms were upstairs. The privy was replaced by bathrooms added at the east end of the house. Downstairs, the cellars were renovated to become public spaces and opened into the garden with French doors. Presumably electricity was installed at this time. Ada's kitchen was probably in the former cellar kitchen. This photo of the porch in 1943 shows it to have a different diamond shaped decoration and handrails had yet to be added on the steps. This sturdy water tank was built in 1923 by architect and builder Edward Henry Tucker. He was the father of diver Teddy Tucker. Inside the house, a passage was made through the buttery-like building so guests could use the tank top as an outdoor seating area to enjoy the harbour view. Decorative balls had now been placed on the peaks of the roof. This postcard was painted about 1924 by Ethel Tucker. It shows the new water tank and the decorative balls. Vegetation looks very rush, lush around the house. In 1962, following the death of Ada Trimmingham, Waterville and 1.2 acres of land was sold for 21,000 pounds to the Bermuda Historical Monuments Trust. Harold Watlington, a member of the Monuments Trust, wrote that the purchase was designed to preserve a charming residence at the Paget entrance to the city of Hamilton. At the same time as the sale of Waterville, the Trimmingham family transferred the plot of land on the eastern side of the house to the Bermuda government to further protect the entrance to the city. It became known as Crow Lane Park. The Bermuda Historical Monuments Trust converted Waterville into three income earning apartments, one on the upper floor and two on the lower. In 1968, Elsie Gosling, whose mother was at Trevingham, became a life tenant of the upper apartment and was to remain there until her death. The entry to the lower apartments was under the front porch. Downstairs, you entered into a communal hallway and the front doors to the east and west apartments were on either side. The front door to the Western apartment, now the development office, has an interesting flower of life symbol etched onto its surface. It is known as a witch's mark and is designed to ward off evil or misfortune. We do not know whether this door was here to protect the goods and people in the cellar or whether it was recycled from elsewhere. The Bermuda National Trust was established by an Act of Parliament on December 22nd, 1969. It was April the next year before the properties of the Monuments Trust were transferred. And it was August 1970 before Waterville was ready to receive its first council members. Both the upstairs apartment and the lower western apartment were occupied. So the office of the newly formed Bermuda National Trust was at the northeast cellar end of the house. The trust office opened on October the 17th, 1970, and was open from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday to Friday. Life tenant Elsie Gosling remained upstairs. In 1975, she commissioned a new fireplace surround in the drawing room from cabinet maker Fred Phillips. The simple swag decoration echoes that on the early 19th century cornice. 
be replaced a metal coal burning fireplace. Elsie Gosling remained upstairs to her death in 1990. Two years later, the trust applied for planning permission to change the zoning of the house from residential to commercial, and so was able to expand its office upstairs. Two rooms, the drawing and dining room, were kept traditionally furnished and open to visitors along with the garden. This is a 1973 painting of Waterbilt by Desmond Fountain. The trust has carefully maintained the form and appearance of this historic grade one listed house, as it is gradually being transferred into a working office. Plumbing, air conditioning, electricity, telephones, and internet connection all need to be continually upgraded and maintenance is ongoing. The exterior of the house has been kept unchanged. An education pro program began at the Trust in 2001, and in 2008, the council room was transformed into a modern schoolroom. The council table, which had been loaned to the Trust by Sandra Wilkinson Outerbridge, came from Norwood in Bailey's Bay. The table, and a portrait of Lady Winifred Hood, Sandra's mother, were, were returned to her twin daughters. Now for a quick look at the changes outside. In 1987, Waterville Park and Duck Island were donated to the Trust by Brothers Fenton and Shorty Trimmingham. It can be reached off Pomander Road. Here you can find black mangroves which once dominated the area around the foot of the rain, lane. The rose garden with its raised beds was officially opened on April 20th, 2001. It replaced an earlier rose garden established in 1988 on the site of the old croquet lawn. The garden was created and is maintained by the Bermuda Rose Society. The Mary Jean Mitchell Green Memorial Garden was opened on August the 12th, 1999. It provides a convenient focus for events in the garden. And so for a final look at Waterville from the air in the 21st century. A lot has happened under this roof in the past 270 years. It is a gracious house that started life in the mid 18th century as a home for a maritime family. Today it stands strong and proud as the headquarters of the Bermuda National Trust. Thank you for watching and a thank you to Jordan Smith and Lauren Simons at Waterville and to Anna Ridgway, the Trust Museum's manager, her expertise with Zoom. That was absolutely wonderful. What a fascinating talk. I'm very privileged to um, work with the rest of the team in this wonderful building and it's so, um, it's so, it's, it's wonderful to just learn more about it.